Shalom, we made it. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Rabbi Vincent P. Adams, and I'm co-founder of Etz Hayim Temple and Energy Center, along with my lovely wife, Navia Leslie Adams. And I want to welcome you here today on the Lunar Shabbat. And really, it's Shabbat, not Lunar Shabbat. I just say Lunar Shabbat uh, so as not to confuse uh, what we're doing today with those who celebrate Shabbat on Saturday. But this is the actual Shabbat that the Bible describes, done or celebrated or observed according to the phases of the moon. So thus the title Lunal Shabbat, which is actually a misnomer, it should just say Shabbat, but as I said, I say lunar. Yep. So that so has to be completely understood. Last night was very spectacular. You know, this is the 50, 15th of ER. And we had a lunar eclipse last night, which was a blood moon. And if you go to my Facebook page, you will see the actual pictures of the blood moon uh, that uh, Navia Leslie took last night. Not NASA pictures or uh, somebody else's rendition, but, you know, the actual uh, blood moon as it occurred. Blood moons are very uh, important in the biblical record. They usually spell some type or foretell of violence, a great deal of violence that is about to occur or an upheaval of some kind. The last set of blood moons that I can remember uh, occurred back in 2015, no. where there were several blood moons in a row that year. And, and within that seven year span, we've had a lot of things happen. Um, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, as well as other things. So it is, fitting that we should have a blood moon uh, this year. It is the year of the Smita as well, which is a, also a very important biblical designation. The temples, the first and the second temples were destroyed in the Smita year. So if you are not being obedient to the word of God, expect a whole lot of upheaval in your life this year if it hasn't already occurred you know when i posted those pictures of the blood moon i i put on there on that post that obedience is paramount it's a blood moon it's a smita year you know smita is when the land is supposed to rest. You're not to supposed to plant seed, cultivate, or reap a harvest. You're supposed to leave your land barren so that the beast of the field can eat and that the, so that the poor can come and reap a harvest from your land. So since we don't look, you know, live in an agrarian um, community, how do you keep the Smita? And I believe that the way that you keep the Smita is to be very generous this year. Increase your giving. You know, live this year with an open hand. Okay? okay. So that's a little bit of housekeeping there about the blood moon and the Smita this year. Oh, Go see Jonathan, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn's new movie. Uh, I believe it came out on the 12th. It's a, a limited showing. It was on the 12th of May, and it's going to be showing again this Thursday on the 19th. This is uh, April, not April, May 16th right now. On May 19th, uh, check your local movie theaters for the limited release. 
Yeah. You know. Har called the Harbingers of things, of things to come. To come. Okay. Yeah. Uh, his other movie on the Harbinger, which I think came out in 2015 or 2014, the last Smeetia year was extremely enlightening. Enlightening. So go see it. You know, I'm I'm anxious to see it this year. I wish it was coming, uh, going to be shown in the movie houses today. Because after we get through here, I would certainly run out and see it. I can't wait to see what he's going to be talking about with this new Smita year and this new blood moon. I'm, I'm really, I'm not going to be entertained. I'm going to be informed. Amen. Amen. Okay. So our Torah portion. Today is called Naso. Naso means to to carry. Okay. To carry or or to take. Mostly I think the definition of to carry is more appropriate. Yeah. Or take, I should say. Take. Take up. Take up. It begins at Leviticus chapter 4, verse 21, and it ends at chapter 7, verse 89. This is one of, it's, it, this is one of or the longest chapter in the Torah portions. And it's considered a very important um Torah lesson in that it connects us to Shavuot, the anniversary of the giving of the Torah, or it also, which means it also connects us to Pentecost, the birthday of the church, when the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, was given to every believer. So it's considered to be a, a, a most important, you know, it, it has way more meaning than what I'm going to cover today. As you know, if you've been following, we are examining the first verse of every Torah portion and decoding it to see what part of the body it is healing. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that again. And I'll quickly run through the rules. We look at the first verse. If we can't decode it from the first verse, we look at the next verse or two. Mm -hmm. If we can't decode it from those two verses, we go to the previous verse or two from the, uh, the previous Torah portion. And as usual, I looked at this verse and I always, I never get, I, I don't, maybe once, but I almost never try to get ahead of myself and look at the next week's tour portion. I always look or almost always look at the tour portion on the day of that tour, of that tour portion. And this time was no different. So after sundown last night, I looked at the Torah portion. I wanted to get kind of a feel for it uh, because I, I had to take some exams today. Uh, don't like doing things on um, right. Shabbat, but I, you know, I just had no choice. As Yeshua said, if, if your ox falls into the ditch on, on Shabbat, who doesn't pull him out? Okay, so I had a situation like that uh, with these exams. So I was studying all day yesterday. At sundown, I stopped and looked at the Torah portion. Then I got up in the middle of the night and studied some more. I got up about two, three o'clock and studied. And then I was taking the exam um, all the way up to, uh, to a little afternoon. I was taking the exam. 
And then I started looking at the tour portion again and took a nap and rested and relaxed, you know, hence the late time that we're starting today. I wanted to start at five, but that didn't work out. So we started a little after six. Okay. But let's get into Nasa, the Torah portion for today. Verse four, excuse me, chapter chapter four, verse twenty-one says, Take also the sum of the sons of Gershon throughout the houses of their fathers by their families. From 30 years old and upward until 50 years old shalt thou number them, all that enter into to perform the service to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. I started actually at, at verse 22. Let's read verse 21. Take, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take also the son of the sons of Gershom. Now, last week, last week was an excellent uh, yeah, yeah. tour portion study. You really should go back if you hadn't already studied that tour portion from last week. It was a an extremely profound teaching. It was great. Okay, linking up Oriental medicine with the scriptures showing the parallel mm -hmm. how oriental medicine and the scriptures are both talking about the same thing that alignment and so this week when i first looked at the torah portion i said oh my goodness this is pretty much actually you know exactly the same as last week the the only you know the major difference just at first glance was that instead of taking a census on all of the men of Israel from age 20 to age 50, this week we're taking a census only of the Levites. Mm -hmm. And this time, instead of from age 20 to age 50, it's age 30 to 50. Now, I didn't do much of a study on the significance of those two numbers. You can probably do that on your own. Uh, I got really hung up, I should say, or really drawn to an, another avenue of study with this. Really? You could say that, oh, why did the census from last week include mm -hmm. ages of men from 20 to 50 to go to war and to take up the um, sort of attacks for the tabernacle. And this week, we're only doing age 30 to 50 on just the Levites. Well, Last week's census was to number the men for war and also for attacks for the upkeep of the tabernacle, the Mishkan in the wilderness. Whereas this week, we are taking up a census, Nassau, take up. We're taking up a census only on the divisions of the Levites for the service of the tabernacle. Last week was for, you know, the defense of the tabernacle and for uh, money for the upkeep. This week is for the service of the tabernacle. Who is going to handle the holy things? We're taking up a census this week for that purpose. Now, this becomes interesting because there are three divisions of Levites. Levi had three sons. Gershom, let's read what they are, okay. Go down, 
Okay. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take also the sum of the sons of Gershom, okay, from 30 years old up to 50. And see, then it says, And they shall bear the curtains of the tabernacle, the coverings. All right. Then that was where it says Gershom, the Gers that's verse 24. 22 and 24, Gershom and the Gershonites. Okay, then we move on after the Gershonites. It should be under the hand for Aaron the priest and the son. Then we do uh, Morari, who is one of the other sons. And we then we have the Kohathites. So the Kohathites or the Morarites Mor and the Gershonites. Those were the, the three divisions of Levites. Gershom, Kohathite, and Morari. Kohath. The three divisions of the Levite. We have three divisions of Levites. One um, I believe it's um, the Kohathites were responsible for the Ark of the Covenant itself. And anything connected with the Ark itself, the Kohathites. Then we have uh, the Gershonites did the curtains and the tapestries that hung around the perimeter and inside the tabernacle. Then we have the Morarites. They took the poles, the foundation, the footings, that part of the tabernacle that supported the curtains, the tapestries, and the various uh, walls of badger skins and other skin seal skins badger skins i don't know where they got uh, correct me is, is seal skins in there or did i just make that up because i'm saying when the heck did they get seals probably, probably. <laughs> in the I desert so, right. <laughs> <laughs> they get but, i might be making that up I'm a, yeah, I don't but know. the badger skins and other animals do a do a search on seal or seal skins to see if that's in the Bible. Yeah, do, do a search real quick. I may have just made that up seal, seal skins, but the badger skins and the other skins of animals that made up the curtains and uh, the various divisions of this section and that section. Yeah. Where is it found? Numbers four six. Numbers four six. Four, eight, four, ten. They talk about the seal skin. Now we're in the. So put the one covering a seal skin shall spread over a cloth of all of blue and shall put in the stage thereof. Goes on to what um, chapters numbers chapters four. You can just see it all over. And that's where we are. Numbers chapter four. All right. Now where in the world did they get seal skins <laughs> in the it middle of the ocean. desert? There was water. There was okay. Water somewhere. I don't think you can find. I know they're in the Sinai Peninsula, so there is water on all sides. I didn't. I, I've never heard of there being seals anywhere in the Middle East, though. But hey, I don't know everything. All right. So we had three divisions: one for the ark itself, one for the foundation and the poles and the things that these various animal skins hung on. You know, like the skeletal system. And then we had others for the curtains and the tapestries and those things that are associated with that. Three divisions. Now remember, we are looking at the first verse of the Torah portion to decode it, to see what 
is it actually referring to in terms of healing? What part of the body does this Torah portion heal? What part of the body will meditating, scanning, and pronouncing and reading this Torah portion in Hebrew, what part of the anointing is affecting what part of the body? Interesting. Mm -hmm. As usual, I read King James and I read New American Standard because it is that one is said to be the best English translation, word for word. <clears throat> As for the sons of Marara, you shall number them by their families, by their families, <clears throat> excuse me, by their families' households. From 30 years and upward, even to 50 years old, you shall number them. Everyone who enters, enters to the service to do the work of the tent of meeting. Okay? And it gives their, their duties. It's funny. Um, this is a, a little... Okay, let me... Then the Lord it said, okay, I was reading verse 29. Let me do verse 21 uh, in uh, the New American Standard. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take a census of the sons of Gershon also by their father's households, by their families. From 30 years and upward to 50 years old, you shall number them, all who enter to perform the service to do the work in the tent of meeting. Okay. Now let's look at the messianic translation. Let's see if there's some revelation there. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take a census of the sons of Gershon also by their father's house and by their clans. Okay. Nothing earth shattering there. Now I'm going to read out of the Kabbalistic Bible, a rabbinical source. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the sum of the sons of Gershon also, by their father's houses, by their families. From 30 years old and upward unto 50 years old shall you number them, all that enter in to wait upon the service, to do service in the tent of meeting. Okay, nothing earth shattering there. We know from last week and even from previous Torah portions, the Lord is speaking. And he's speaking to Moses, so he's obligated to heal the ears and the hearing of Father Moshe. We know from Oriental medicine that hearing is associated with good kidney health. The ears are shaped like kidneys. So in Oriental medicine, if we want to enhance hearing, we enhance kidney function. Now, Father Yahweh spoke to Moses. Moses heard. Then Moses turned in turn spoke to Aaron. So he is now obligated to enhance Moses' hearing and his speech and to do the same thing for Aaron. Because Aaron had to hear mm -hmm. and he had to speak to the divisions of the Levites as well as well as his sons mm -hmm. okay his sons were not part of the division of the levites but they were priests all right okay. now so we've got that division we know from last week how this whole sequence parallels what in oriental medicine is called the heart kidney axis. Now, I'm not going to go over that. 
uh, again at all today. But, you know, I strongly advise as a prerequisite that you go and watch and listen to and study last week's Torah portion so that you can really uh, get the benefit of this week's Torah portion teaching. So part of this is exactly the same as last week. Okay. What are the differences? As stated, instead of a census for all of the men of Israel, this is the census for the Levites, for the sons of Levi. Okay. That's the biggest ex this distinction between last week and this week. So let's follow that path. What could it possibly be? And to be honest with you, if you're not under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I, I don't think you would get it. You know, first and foremost, I'm under the guidance of the Holy Spirit as to the revelation of what this Torah portion is referring to with regard to healing. Also, I'm under not only the guidance for revelation today, but the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I would say over the past 30 something years, I would not be able to give you the revelation without following the path of the Ruach HaKodesh that he has laid out for me over the past 30 years. I'm drawing on over 30 years of experience, 30 years of studying the Bible, Torah, the Gospels, and so forth. 30 years of studying anatomy and physiology, which is well over 30 years. It started back in high school and high school biology and then in college and all of that coming together. All of my scientific study of astrology biblical astrology, medical astrology, vibrational astrology. All of these endeavors that I have been led to engage in by the Holy Spirit. And you're, you're about to see why. Three divisions of Levites. We have a parallel with this scripture. Last week, it was oriental medicine, the heart, kidney, axis. This week, we're going to go more to Western medicine. But it has to parallel last week's. It has to represent the same thing in Western medicine that it represented last week in oriental medicine. Remember, we saw this was a, I don't know what you call parallel or representation of heaven and earth in the heart, kidney axis with respect to healing. How the relationship between the father and Moses and the Levites and, you know, Aaron and his sons and the Levites and the connection to the people, how that represent, how that heart kidney axis represented that whole biblical narrative. And this week, I'm going to show you how this biblical narrative of the Torah portion represents that same picture, but only according to Western medicine. Now, there are similarities between 
the Oriental medicine and the Western. But the Western medicine that we're doing today is different for a different part of the body than the heart kidney axis of last week. I want you to start thinking about scripture anthropomorphically. In other words, when we did this last week, I didn't refer to it being anthropomorphic by name, but that's what I was really doing last week. This week, I'm referring to it by name, anthropomorphically. We're going to read the scripture anthropomorphically. And in so doing, we're going to bring in Western medicine, but we're also going to bring in a large portion of um, Asian medicine. Okay, let's be, let me show this to you. We're going to make a connection between Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 through 9 or 10. And then we're going to make a connection between Genesis chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 4. And finally, Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to show you that those three chapters are all referring to the same thing on an anatomical basis for healing. Let's first look at Genesis. Genesis to Revelation. Genesis chapter 2. I'm laying the foundation of the interpretation or exegesis of Leviticus chapter 4, verses 21. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Let's begin at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Man is formed or made from the dust of dirt of the ground. The Lord took dirt and formed and fashioned him. Let me go up a little higher. Okay. Verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Let's start at verse 4 here. These are the... No, Verse 5. Good. Well, that verse, let's see, the Lord. Okay. Let's go to verse 8. We did verse 7. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man who, whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden. I'm looking for a scripture where it says, and God saw everything. I'm just going to read chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth 
and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth. That's what I was looking for. Verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now verse 6 is important because it says that there went up a mist from the ground, from underground springs and wells that watered the face of the earth in the garden. So you know what, ha what happens when water hits dirt? It becomes mud. You know, it becomes something you can fashion. It's not dusty anymore. You can shape it into just about every, anything. What do we know about mud and dirt today? We know that there are microorganisms in the ground, in the dirt. So we will form with these microorganisms rolled up and formed into us. And we call that our microbiome today, which is in our, our stomach lining, in our gut. Okay? Now you may say, okay, where is he going with this? All right. I'm going to take my time here. This, this, this is important. All right. Let's go verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Where is this going on? In the midst of the garden. Notice the use of the word garden. Okay? Even back in verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward. Okay? Now, verse 10, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Now, why is this significant? I thought I was the only one who had this revelation to, uh, I watched um, Brother Robert Heidler teach on this one day. And I said, oh, I'm not crazy after all. Someone else sees the, same thing that I see. I asked myself when I, were, when I read verse 10 one day, a couple of years ago, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. Now, most of us are under the assumption that Eden or Edan is the same as Garden or Gardan, that they're one and the same, but they're not. And I asked myself, you know, the question I said, why would a river come out of Eden to water the garden? That didn't make sense to me. And when I looked at the Hebrew, Eden means pleasure. And garden means, in Hebrew, we have it translated as garden, a garden means actually enclosure. So a river came out of pleasure to water the enclosure, the enclosure, which is what we call the garden or the Garden of Eden, as we've been, I don't want to say misled, but it, it looks that way, you know, and that's what. Uh, the various men and women have taught, you know, the brethren and, you know, the fellowship for 2,000 years, practically. But there are two different things. And I surmise through the Holy Spirit and the study of other scripture that Eden was actually heaven. 
actually what we call New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. And I think I can prove that to you. I think I'll, I'll show it to you. And it comes out, it comes down really into the garden to water it. And then that river or that flow branches out into four parts. When I began, when the Holy Spirit told me to look at that anthropomorphically, the four parts became my right arm, my left arm, my right leg, and my left leg. Remember back in verse 7, it says, God breathed into man the breath of life. That breath of life, that flow, was breathed into the lungs, went into the right arm, the left arm, the right leg, and the left leg, left leg, and man became a living soul. When you look at that scripture, anthropomorphically, that's what you come up with. Now, here's the reason, one of the reasons why I was able to come up with that and see that on the direction of the Holy Spirit, when you go to Revelation chapter 22, let's go there, Revelation chapter 22. We're going to fast forward to the past. Chapter 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. Okay. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Did you catch that? And he showed me a pure river of water of life. That's the river that split into four parts in Revelation chapter 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, referring to the fact that crystals were in that water. A river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So God the Father is in the throne, the Lamb is in the throne, and then the river comes out of the throne, which is the Holy Spirit. That is what is flowing through Adam in Genesis chapter 2. This is describing Genesis chapter 2, anthropomorphic, well, it is anthropomorphic, but it's describing it. And we can look both of them, not only literally, but also anthropomorphically. Okay? In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I don't have that. Yes, I do. I prefer to read this from the Aramaic English New Testament, which is translated not from the Greek into English, but from the original language of the New Testament which was Aramaic, and you will get more revelation that way. And I'm going to show you that here. Taking my time here, stay with me, please. And he showed me a river of living water, transparent. Living water it has to be the Holy Spirit, living water transparent as crystal, which proceeded from the throne of Elohim and the Lamb. 
and in the middle of its broad avenue and near the river on this side and on that was the tree of life which bore 12 sorts of fruits or as in sorts of fruit is in parentheses which bore 12 fruits yielding one of its fruits each month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations okay for King James, it would appear that there were 12 manner of fruit every month, and the leaves, you know, this fruit and the leaves were for the healing of the nations. This is more accurate. The um, Aramaic New Testament by Andrew Gabriel Roth, who is a Jewish messianic rabbi. We see here in the ANT version, the Aramaic uh, English New Testament that only one fruit is produced each month. Now that means, you know, that immediately alludes to biblical astrology. A different type of fruit that is for healing is produced each month and the leaves are for the healing of the nations anthropomorphically this is your body that river is coming down from the throne room as we just read in verse one what does the river come from in revelations 22 it comes directly out of the throne where is the river coming from in Genesis chapter 2, it's coming directly out of the throne. And it splits into four. Arms, two arms, and two legs. Now, what does the 12 manner of fruit mean? Where is that, you know, where are you going with that? In Oriental medicine, there are three meridians that run on the inside of the arm. Three on the outside of the arm of both arms and they're mirror images of each other this is the long meridian on the left on my left and this is the long meridian on my right they're mirror images of each other there are three meridians or energy flows that run down the inside of the leg and three on the outside so you have a total of 12 meridians okay on each side of the body six in the arm six in the leg right leg i mean right leg and right arm left arm and left leg and down the middle middle is an energy flow that feeds these 12 meridians so that river running out of the throne is actually running through us and it nourishes the 12 meridians say leslie can you get that and those 12 meridians are being nourished by that river running out of the throne in oriental medicine there are 12 meridians each meridian is more active at a different time of the year than another meridian. So according to Rolf, each meridian is producing fruit or more active at a different time of year. Each meridian is during one particular season has great potential for healing and then at another time it's another meridian and it moves in that circle of life in that fashion and we can deduce that with Ross translation 
from the um, the Aramaic into English, but we lose that completely in the in the English translation from the Greek, and it's I think it's the same in the New American Standard. And he showed me a river. I'm reading New American Standard. And he showed me a river of, of water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb of God. In the middle of his street and on either side of the river was there a tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree before the healing of the nations. So even in the New American Standard, they're saying, hey, it's bearing 12 different types of fruit every month as opposed to one particular type of fruit each month for a total of 12 months and then recycling over again. So we get a much better translation and understanding translating from Aramaic into English, which was the original language, Aramaic, as opposed to Greek into English. The scriptures were actually translated from Aramaic or Hebrew into Greek, and then we get it as it comes down to us today in the King James and other English translations. But the original was Aramaic. So looking at that anthropomorphically, we see the 12 called trees of life. These meridians that I'm talking about, they're trees of life and they bear fruit. So anthropomorphically, the description that Oriental medicine uses matches uh, very well with scripture. Very, very well. 12 meridians on the right, 12 on the left, uh, energy flow coming down the center of the body that nourishes both of them just like the river of life coming out of the throne and nourishing the trees of life on either side of the river in Revelation 22. Now going back to the future in Genesis chapter 2, that same river coming out of Eden that same river really coming out of the throne, okay? Coming out of the throne and into the garden, splitting up into four divisions. Right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. You see the comparison? When we look at both those scriptures, anthropomorphically what's going on now here in revelation chapter 22 that river is also corresponding with um chiropractic medicine in chiropractic medicine the nervous system runs down the spine and innervates all of the internal organs and muscles. Just like that river, that life force flow runs down the center of our body and nourishes these meridians. And the name of these meridians are the names of internal organs. You got lung, pericardium, heart, large intestine, small intestine, liver, kidney, bladder, gallbladder. They're all the name in oriental medicine, they're all the names of internal organs. Just like in chiropractic medicine, 
the nerves coming down the spine connect to all the internal organs and the four limbs. Different branch of holistic medicine, same principle. Same principle for Western chiropractic holistic medicine, same principle for oriental holistic medicine. Coming down the center of the body, nourishing the limbs, the four limbs, controlling them. Now, the former show you, you know, this throne room scenario, this anthropomorphic throne room scenario. That's what we're talking about. I know some of you, you may say that, okay, Rabbi, in Genesis, how come it, does, it says the river comes out of Eden to water the garden? How come it doesn't say it comes down? Because Adam hadn't failed yet. The earth was on the same level as New Jerusalem. That's why I say it comes out of Eden. It comes out of pleasure into the enclosure. Oh, you got to shout there. You know, before the fall. See, we think of when we hear that expression before the fall, we think of Adam falling from grace. It was that expression, yeah, denotes Adam's fall from grace, but it also denotes the fall of the earth realm from the level of Eden down. Hmm. Now there's this, now you got to pray to get what you want out of heaven into earth. Yeah. Yeah. Before it just flowed. It just flowed directly. It was on the same level. It was in the same plane. It was in the same dimension. But after the fall, bam, there was distance. Hmm. There was separation. And in that separation was what? Ha Satan. Mm -hmm. He's in the separation. That's his whole mission, is to keep us separated from that flow. Mm -hmm. Going to and fro about the earth. I can't understand you. He was like this, and I was like, that's that to and fro. He was going to and fro, not okay. up and down, but to and fro. You know what I mean? All right. And she was going to and fro, she could be making a vow. Well, it actually says to and fro and up and down in. So because died. after after the fall, he would go up and down. Okay. Okay. But before that, everything was on the same level. Okay. That's the reason why in Genesis chapter 2, it doesn't say it came down out of Eden. It just came out of Eden into the garden because they were on the same plane they were in the same dimension okay. with no blockage and no separation so we're looking or we just looked at genesis chapter 2 anthropomorphically and revelation chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 anthropomorphically and we see that they are one in the same. Genesis chapter 2 is describing Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Now, we saw here that it is a river of life, pure as crystal. That means it was crystal. Okay? Now, Let's go back and look at Genesis chapter 2 one more time. I'm going to further prove to you that it's talking about the same thing. Verse 10, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. 
and a river ran out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Read King James. The name of the first river is Pison. This is that which can pass, passes the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is also Bedelium and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gion. In the river, there are crystal. Onyx is a crystal. Let me read that in the New American Standard. And the goal of that land is good. Verse 12. The palladium and the onyx stone are there. There is crystals in the, the river in Genesis chapter 2. There are crystals in the river of Genesis, not Genesis, yep. but Revelations 22. Right. Okay? We see the both these scenes mention crystals. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to look at Revelations chapter 4. And I'm going to show you that the scene described in Revelation chapter 4 is the same scene that is described in Revelation chapter 22. And by, you know, if A equals B and B equals C, then C equals A. So not only is Revelation chapter 4 the same scene described in more detail that is depicted in Revelation chapter 22, but it also means that Revelation chapter 4 equals Re Revelation chapter 4 equals Genesis chapter 2. Okay, let's get there. Now, all of this is a foundation. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the, voice, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet, or as a shofar. If I read it to you, out of Rolf, it'll say shofar. Okay. Voice as a shofar talking with me. Remember, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 says, The Lord's voice, Yeshua's voice is as the sound of a mighty shofar. Mm -hmm. Which say, Come up, a voice talking with me, which say, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper, that's a crystal, and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Okay? We have these crystals, jasper, Sardine and an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. Okay. I've taught this in many different lessons here and there, but we're made in God's image. If God has seven spirits, then we have seven spirits. These seven spirits described here 
burn brightly before the throne. They don't emanate from the throne, but they burn brightly before the throne. That's our auras. Those are the seven auras which burn brightly before us, around us. Okay? Thinking of this anthropomorphically again. Those seven spirits are the seven auras. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Okay, let's look at this anthropomorphically. This whole scene, we want to look at it anthropomorphically. The seven spirits are the seven auras. Because if God has it, we have to have. We're made in his image. Okay? The four beasts. Okay, all right? Mm -hmm. you, have, you have the central figure is the lamb as it had been slain. We know from chapter 22 that the Lamb is in that throne, that the Father is in that throne, and that the Holy Spirit comes out of the throne. But in this scripture, it's described as a sea, not a river, a sea of glass, a sea of crystals. We have the mention of three crystals here. Remember, this is the same scene that we see in chapter 22. Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 22 are the same scenes. Therefore, Genesis chapter 2 is the same scene. It's described as a river branching out into four parts. We already told you what those four parts are. Thinking of it anthropomorphically. Now here, we also have the number four but we have four beasts. So since the four beasts or the four living creatures surround our, are part of the inner circle of the throne, they're the first outer circle, these four beasts, it is also the four limbs. Amen? Okay, so anthropomorphically, we have the throne in chapter 4. We have the four beasts, which refer to the four limbs. Then we have the 24 elders round the throne. 24. How many meridians or how many manner of fruit are there? on either side of the river or what is described as the sea a sea of glass we have 12 on one side of the of the sea of glass of crystal and we have 12 on the others we have 24 elders do you see the connection Thinking of these scriptures anthropomorphically gives us great insight into healing modalities such as acupuncture and oriental medicine, such as chiropractic care, mm -hmm. such as the use of crystals, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. the use of herbs, because in Revelation chapter 22, the leaves and the fruit are for the healing, for the healing. Of the nations. I can go into some other details, but I think you get it. Now, all of this, Genesis chapter 2, Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 22, not to mention Revelation chapter 21 with the streets of gold, and we know back in Genesis chapter 
Two, there was gold in that whole mix. But now we have a foundation for healing, for healing. Because what the scripture said, say is the purpose of all this. The purpose is for healing. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, the, the whole purpose of those two verses is the summation of healing. Using astrology, herbology, oriental medicine, acupuncture, okay, and also chiropractic care. Yeah, you said that. All right. For healing. For healing. Now let's get into our Torah portion. What do we have in our Torah portion? Take. What did you say? Said take. What? To take. To take. That's what it means. Okay. We have three divisions. Remember in last week's Torah portion that the heart kidney axis and the representation or the anthropomorphic representation is that God is speaking to Moses. Moses speaks to Aaron and his sons and they distribute, they go out from the center axis from this, this center pole. Remember, we had the, the description of the heart kidney axis as two poles. One being uh, the pole in heaven and the other one being located here on earth. Axis, a pole, a straight line. We see a straight line being depicted in Revelation chapter 22. We see a division of three, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. In 22, we have the river coming out of the throne, straight line, and on either side, the trees of life, three, a division of three, in an axis, in a straight line. Here, we have, again, as we did last week, a straight line axis and a division of three. This three are the three sons of Levi. We still have as the top of the pole, God speaking to Moses. Moses speaking to Aaron, uh, his brother Aaron, and his nephews, Aaron's sons. Then after that communication line or axis, along that axis, God, Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's sons, and the Levites, and then the Levites going out amongst the people because remember now they were responsible these three divisions were responsible for the things of the temple thinking of leviticus chapter 4 verses 21 and a few others there thinking of that anthropomorphically that three division from the central outward. The Mishkan did not move unless this division of three moved first. What is this division of three? Instead of the heart kidney axis from last week, we now have the nervous system, the central nervous system has basically three main divisions. The central nervous system itself, 
the peripheral nervous system and what's called the enteric nervous system. The Levites, one group was responsible for the innermost, the innermost workings of the tabernacle, the ark itself. Another group was responsible for the coverings and the curtains. Then a third group was be responsible for the structural component, the support system. The nervous system receives impulses from the brain. You can describe God speaking to Moses and then Moses speaking to Aaron or God speaking to the both of them as the right brain and the left brain. Moses representing perhaps the right brain and Aaron representing the left brain. The central nervous system is described as the brain and the spinal column. Then branching out, again, we're talking about branching out. Then branching out from that, you have the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system governs what functions of the body, the bones and muscles the structural components of our body. Just, just like one of the groups, I think it was Morari, who was responsible for the structural elements of the tabernacle. Morari. The peripheral part of the peripheral nervous system controls the peripheral, the structural components the bones, the ligaments, the muscles. Then on the innermost, innermost parts, you have another group of Levites that take care of that. You can call that the internal organs. Mm -hmm. Then the enteric nervous system governs the gastrointestinal aspect of the body. And since the enteric system is, can act independently, it's called the third brain. And if you study the microbiome system, those, you know, the enteric system, nervous system, is called a second brain. The, the microbiome system is called a second brain also. And, and it's part of the enteric, in, enteric nervous system. ENS. And it is also called the second brain. And it acts independently, although it is influenced by the rest of the peripheral nervous system and thereby the central nervous system as well. It can also act independently of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has three divisions the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, and the enteric. Those are the three divisions of the Levites. From the anatomic nervous system, which is a branch of the peripheral nervous system. You can break this down if, if you like. You can say that God is the brain speaking to Moses. Moses is the central nervous system. Uh, Aaron and his sons are the um, peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system has three divisions, sympathetic, 
parasympathetic, and enteric. And those three divisions really is what controls the body. From the peripheral into the interior of the stomach and the organs. So this week's Torah point, next, I say you can break that down however you like. Okay? But that those three divisions of the anatomic nervous system absolutely represents the three divisions of the Levites and their functions of what part of the tabernacle they were responsible for. So this week's Torah portion is healing of the central nervous system the peripheral nervous system, the anatomic, the autonomic nervous system, and the auto, those three divisions, and the autonomic nervous system has three divisions, and there are even more. But that division of three, of the three Levites gives us the clue. The division what we see in Genesis chapter 21, the three also give us a clue. When looking as a whole, Genesis chapter two, Revelation chapter four, Revelation chapter 22, looking at those three chapters anthropomorphically, and then looking at this Torah portion, Leviticus chapter 4, beginning at verse 21, looking at that anthropomorphically, we get more specifically the central nervous system. The central nervous system, which, call, which controls the movement and function of the body, broken down into the peripheral and the autonomic, and then further broken down into the three other divisions, sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric. This week's Torah portion is what you need to meditate on if you have any nerve damage or to make good, healthy nerve impulses of your central, peripheral, and autonomic nervous system. If you need healing, if you're a diabetic experiencing neuropathy, if you've had a stroke, any type of nerve damage, this tour portion is the tour portion that you should med meditate on. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm almost through. I just kind of want to talk about the blood moon which occurred you know last night really really today um for some reason okay i decided when i was studying for the test under the you know the blood moon last night the holy spirit told me to get out my collection of jade mm -hmm. you know I've got several forms of jade. I got black jade. I got green jade. I got jadeite jade. I have uh, my rainbow jade here and regular jade here in these four spheres and free form. Um, as you can see, I have two different types of jade here. Okay, on this sword, and I have rose quartz. J is to strengthen the heart. Then I have, I call it my rainbow J because it's like a rainbow. I think it's actually called violet J. It's got the green, a little bit of the yellow and the purple, almost like a rainbow. I've got it wrapped so you can't see it completely. But if you tilt it in the light, you see that rainbow flashing back and forth, the green, the purple, a little touch of yellow, different shades of violet. 
in this J. Then I have some polished raw J, like a Geo here, a green J. And I have my black J. Okay. And some freeform J, as well as some jade spears. And this is for heart strengthening and heart protection. We went to the, the rock shop Saturday. I just wanted to drop by and peek. I hadn't been in this particular rock shop uh, in several months. And I wanted to go by and say hi. I wasn't intending to buy anything. Um, what is this right here? As you, as you like, as you like, Amazonite. Amazonite, mm -hmm. also a heart energy, as well as rose quartz, mm -hmm. uh, the most powerful heart energy of the crystals. And every time I go in, I always ask, "Hey, have you got any jade around or whatever?" And they've got this really big, huge piece of uh, raw of raw jade. And he says, "I'm not. That's not for sale, Vince. Rabbi, it's not for sale." Mm -hmm. And I said, really? And I said, okay. And if I buy something, they say, you want me to bubble wrap that, Rabbi? I said, you got enough bubble wrap to bubble? You know, and he always laughs. And on my way out, this fella caught my eye. He was over in the corner where you can't even, you know, behind the counter, in the furthest corner behind the counter with other things in front of it. I don't know how I zoomed in on that. Bam! Caught it. Wasn't, you know, I wasn't looking for it, but I caught it. <laughs> so he gave me a good price on it. So I, I went ahead and got it, even though I wasn't planning on purchasing anything. And there was another piece of a, a slab, a raw slab of Jake. And I said, How much for this? And I said, I'm going to have to come back on that one, you know. Um, but I found, I had asked, they weren't, they didn't even tell me that they had this jade. The one that I purchased and even the other one that's for sale. So they weren't trying to push jade on me, even though I, um, came in asking for it. And I was walking out the door. I was literally walking out the door. Boom. And I, and I, and I, and I saw it. So, you know, when you buy crystals, the crystals call to you. They attract you some way. We say call, you know, and that call is experienced as an attraction, a strong attraction sometimes. And when you're in a rock shop, usually there's going to be someone there who's very sensitive to the various energies that are present. And this one lady, she said, oh, the energy of the energy of that jade really suits you. You know, it really matches your natural energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I listen, you know, to people who are sensitive like that. Um, sometimes I engage them. Um, always trying to lead them to the Lord. I wish I'd have spent more time talking with her and conversing with her now. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of trying to get out of there because, like I said, I had this, these exams to take and I needed to get back and start studying and getting things out of the way, uh, you know, from business so that I could, you know, have, the, you know, the way clear to study, you know, I won't have anything nagging at me. So oh, well, I, I didn't take care of this. I didn't take care of that. But when I got back, I got out my jade. I've got, you know, I've got some rose quartz, which is also hard energy uh, and some um, malachite, which is one of the stones that was in the breastplate of the high priest. But I didn't bring those out and I've got a few others. Uh, road night and rotocrosite 
also hard energy. We know, but Jade was just, I just had Jade on the brain. And I really wasn't thinking about the uh, full moon, the blood moon. I really wasn't thinking about that that much. You know, I was more concerned with my upcoming exams. And, but Holy Spirit told me to get it out and place it out. So as I was studying, I had all my jade out. I had a couple of others out too, but you know, all this jade I had out. And then Leslie went out and took pictures of the blood moon. I think that's the actual, the first blood moon that I've actually seen with my naked eye. I've seen pictures all over the place. But I think back in 2015, it was a, a cloudy night. I, I didn't actually see it. But this was the first time I actually saw it. And I could, you know, when you see it and you act, you actually see that orange moon or that reddish orange moon. Wow, you know, it's not just something talked about. It's not just something from pictures. And I know the, um, the implications of a blood moon. And there are forces that are present during a blood moon that your heart needs to be either shielded from or strengthened to receive from. You need either a combination of protection, strengthening, or some type of medium to absorb, what have you. And now I, I believe that the reason that the Holy Spirit told me, get out your jade, get out your jade, was because of the blood moon. Not because I like jade and I just wanted to spend some money on uh, expanding my jade collection. I really do believe that there was something in the anointing of my jade that I was supposed to take advantage of. Also, a full moon also strengthens the effect and re renews the energetic anointing of all your crystals. So I, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit wanted me to take as a full advantage of my jade during the blood moon. I don't think it was just me wanting to, you know, to spend some money on, on Jade. Because during, during the blood moon, all of your stones are enhanced. But the anointing that's on Jade, I believe the Holy Spirit wanted me to experience and, and receive. Just wanted to share that with you. Um, Study for yourselves the effects of the blood moon and what it means on the internet. I, I think you, you might agree. One thing about jade is that it has a calming effect. With all that energy coming off of the blood moon, perhaps I needed you know some refinement of that energy in a calming sense to go along with it. If I, if, if I get out all my notes on Jade, I'm sure I, I, I'll see the, the reason. If, and if I study some more on the blood moon, probably something I've learned years ago that I forgot and I'll see why, you know, the Holy Spirit told me to get out my Jade. So I was obedient, I didn't miss out. I do kind of wonder now, maybe I should have got all, all my rose quartz and other heart energies, but the Holy Spirit didn't say rose quartz. It didn't say my other heart energy stones. It said jade, it says jade. Get your jade out. Get your jade out, okay? Mm -hmm. So watch your heart. 
Watch your heart. You know, one thing of the blood moon signifies the senseless violence. And over the weekend, we had 10 people killed in Buffalo, New York. <clears throat> then we had a shooting, a shooting over the weekend <clears throat> at a church in, um, in California. They say the parishioners jumped a guy after he shot one person. They didn't, they didn't sit around, they jumped him. Yeah. So the heart, people's hearts are affected negatively during the blood moon. That's why it's, it's, it's considered a omen, a bad omen for Israel and for those who've been disobedient. You know, it, with experience, as I said earlier, a lot of upheaval in their life. So be careful. Because the blood moon is real, and uh, some people are not protected against its effects. I know you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, but and by the blood of Yeshua, and, and the blood and the blood. But be careful. Be careful. There's that doesn't mean that there's not a force right. acting upon you. You can overcome it with the blood. You can overcome it by the power of the Holy Ghost. But it doesn't mean that it's not operating. It's not trying. If you've got any chink in your armor, if you have an open door somewhere, you know, it can get in. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to end there. Watch these two Torah portions. You know, Together. When I say together, watch last week's Bombard Beer and watch this week's Nassau and take some good notes because I gave you a ton of information today and I gave you a wealth and a ton of information last week. You really, really need to study last week's Torah portion and this week's and meditate on the Hebrew letters of the first. And, uh, and second verses of those two Torah portions. And you'll get a tremendous amount of healing. Tremendous amount of healing. Amen. Well, may the blessings of our risen Lord, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, be upon you. Shabbat Shalom. See you next week.